Hey, I'm Amy. I'm 23, and I've been besties with my neighbor Drew for years. But I've never thought of sabotaging his wedding, ever. Heck, I thought I'd be the one marrying him. Well, I mean, if no one better came along, Drew's two years older than me. But back then, I wasn't your regular girly girl. Instead, I much preferred hanging out with the boys and playing basketball, so we quickly became best friends. But when I hit puberty, how I looked began to matter more to me, so I started making efforts and behaved more like a lady, result being that guys started noticing me, Drew included. One time back in high school, Drew asked me out, but I just laughed it off and told him to stop kidding. In other words, I rejected him. It was good to know that I had him as a backup, but right then and there, I didn't want to date him. Why would I, when I could have any boy in the school? After that, he pretty much did anything I asked, treated me like a princess, and followed me everywhere I went. Heck, we were so close that it was an in-joke with my family that we would end up together. When I went to study in Europe for three years, Drew was still there for me when I went through tough times, or even breakups. Being in a different country meant that Drew and I didn't talk as much as we used to, but I knew that if I needed him, then all I needed to do was click my fingers and he'd appear. Whenever I came back home for the holidays, he was always there at the airport waiting to pick me up. So when I finished my studies and arrived home for good, I expected him to be there to pick me up with a large bunch of flowers in hand. But no, he didn't show up. It was only my parents waiting for me. On the journey home, I sat there sulking. Drew had majorly annoyed me. How dare he stand me up? Sensing my mood, Mom asked, Sweetie, what's up? Aren't you happy to be back? I muttered out, Yeah, I just don't appreciate Drew not picking me up. Mom casually said, Oh, right. Although, I suppose planning the wedding is keeping him busy. I'm sure he just forgot. I sat upright in my seat. What? Wedding? Whose wedding? My mom then acted surprised. He didn't tell you? Oh, how busy the groom-to-be must be. <laughs> Honey, it's Drew's wedding. This uneasy feeling washed over me. I felt like I'd been cheated on. Okay, so I didn't love him. But that's not the point. How dare some girl come along and steal him away from me? I arrived home to see Drew pacing the curb. He spotted me and gave me an excited wave. I stormed over to him and shouted out, Why didn't you tell me you're getting married? He smiled and then replied, I'm sorry, Amy. I just wanted to do it in person as I have an important question to ask you. He sounded so serious. Then he reached into his pocket. OMG, was he going to propose to me? Has this all been a prank leading to this moment? But no, he pulled out a packet of mints and offered me one. At that moment, a girl walked out of his house and passed him a coffee. He wrapped his arms around her waist and kissed the top of her head. Yuck! Amy, you remember Emily, right? She was in your year at school. She's my fiancé. We'd like to ask you to be our bridesmaid. Emily added, Actually, he wanted you to be his best man, since we all know how close you guys are, but that would look a little strange, don't you think? I just stood there speechless with my mouth wide open. No, I didn't remember this Emily girl from school, and I didn't want to be her stupid bridesmaid. Drew joked, Aren't you happy for me? I know you'll love this. That's why I waited till now to tell you, to be able to see your over-the-top reaction. <laughs> I had no reaction. I literally couldn't find any words to say and just stood there motionless as the realization that the guy I could always count on was now someone else's, and I was meant to help them out with their lame wedding. I tried being happy for them, but they just made me feel so sick. Now whenever I wanted to see Drew, there's Emily tagging along, and they always talk to each other in this annoying high-pitched voice, not to mention the kissing and hugging every five seconds. I couldn't stand seeing their PDA for another moment, so I decided to pull some mischievous pranks. First, I kept asking Emily to eat fast foods with me, which I told her that I extremely craved for since I'd been abroad for so long. But the real reason was just that I wanted her to gain weight quickly and be unable to fit into her wedding dress. And I succeeded. When the three of us visited the wedding shop, whichever dress that Emily liked to try, she couldn't fit in. So the only one that fitted her looked very old-fashioned and ugly. Seeing her sulky face, I was so happy inside. Until Drew ran towards her and comforted her, he praised her as the most beautiful woman in the world, no matter what she wore. And he was very lucky to marry her. Ugh, 
I want to puke for real. A few days later, Emily held her bachelorette party. As the party venue was close to my house, Emily and her friends decided to come over to prepare themselves before the party. Though I found it bothersome at first, then I realized that it's a good opportunity for another prank. That afternoon, when they were all busy putting on makeup and getting dressed, I offered to help Emily iron her dress as I was ironing mine. She agreed and handed me the dress. I secretly turned up the iron's temperature and it burnt her silk dress in a blink. I screamed and acted like it was an accident. Emily and her friends immediately rushed over. They were shocked to see the dress was totally ruined. I apologized frantically as tears started to well up in Emily's eyes. Are you sure you didn't do it on purpose? A friend of Emily asked me. Then everyone gave me a dirty look. No, don't say that. Amy's just trying to help me, Emily said through tears. Jeez, why did she have to be so nice? After that, she called Drew, cried desperately, and told him everything. And just half an hour later, Drew showed up and handed Emily a brand new dress, which is even prettier than the old one. Emily hugged Drew, kissed him on the cheek, and went on and on about how he's the best. Yuck. Suddenly, some of Emily's friends whispered something like, Emily is so lucky to have a fiancé like Drew. Unlike Carl, he is really useless. So Carl was Emily's ex, right? I wondered if he also wanted to break this wedding like me. So I did some digging online and easily found Carl. Then I messaged him, telling him I was Emily's bridesmaid and I had something super urgent to tell him about her. He agreed to meet me at a bar downtown. First impression? This guy's actually kinda cute. Turns out, goody two-shoes Emily has good taste in guys. As I sat down next to him, I noticed that Carl had been drinking a lot. But... I didn't think much of it at the time. I gave my best convincing look and told him, Emily still has feelings for you. She's now having cold feet about the wedding. At first, he didn't say much. He just kept on drinking. But suddenly, he stood up and slurred out how he needed to confess his love to her. Right now! So I followed him to her house. That night, the bridesmaids were having a sleepover at Emily's to help her prepare the guest list for the wedding and stuff. I quickly came in and made up some excuse for showing up late. And that's when we all heard something noisy coming from outside. Everyone ran to the porch to check out Carl begin to drunkenly slur out something like, I will always love you and such. Emily looked shocked and tried persuading Carl to go home. I watched on with a secret smirk as he threw up in her pot plant, accused the other bridesmaids of being traitors, and tripped over the cat as he tried to enter her house. Carl eventually passed out on the couch, and Emily, being Emily, placed a blanket over him. She didn't even look angry. Why? I couldn't understand why I had done so many things, but she could be so calm and overcame everything. The next day, when Carl woke up, they talked, and I was terrified Carl would tell Emily about my involvement. But instead, he apologized to her, wished her the best for the future, then left. A few days later, Carl asked me to meet him at a coffee shop. He asked me why I lied to him, as Emily said she was very blissful to marry Drew. I sighed and told him the truth. I also said that I didn't have feelings for Drew, I just hated to see the two of them together. Then Carl said, Don't let jealousy get the best of you. Listen to me, Amy. What we need to do now is restore our life and leave the past behind. I felt down upon hearing his words, but I knew Carl was right. Despite Drew having been my best friend since childhood, it was the moment he needed to have a life of his own. Don't be so sad, Carl said, patting my hand gently. I looked up and was fascinated by not only Carl's look, but also his maturity and sensitivity. The wedding day came. I stood next to Drew and Emily as they exchanged their rings to take a vow to be husband and wife. Somehow, I felt so proud that my best friend found his life partner. But still, I felt a little uneasy inside, until I spotted Carl in the crowd. He walked over, gave me a bright smile, and joked that he was going to spend the rest of the day here so I couldn't cause any more havoc. I laughed out loud and responded, It was more about him than me that would be causing trouble in the wedding. After the ceremony, we spent time together walking through the park and went to an arcade. I have to admit that it was kind of fun and took my mind off things. Since then, something weird happened. I've found myself thinking about Carl a lot. Like, a lot. Am I developing feelings for him? Maybe now is the time for me to find my life partner too. And I think I've found a great candidate. Hi, I'm Olive. And at the young age of just 23... I've decided I'm totally done with love. Why, you ask? 
Well, because all men are jerks, liars, and fraudsters. They're like magpies. They're always looking for something new and shiny to come along. So, your boyfriend is different? Yeah, whatever. I've heard it all before. I've believed it all before, too. Trust me. But as much as it sucks to hear that all guys are the same, I'll tell you why. It all began back in high school when I had a massive crush on this boy called Xavier. He was so dreamy, handsome, and talented. We bonded over our love for music, and we were in the same school choir together. Every musician has a muse, right? I believed that I was Xavier's only muse and no one could replace me. In my eyes, he could do nothing wrong. Being around him filled me with butterflies and I couldn't wait to go to college with him and share my life with him. But then, I caught him in the music room, kissing some other girl. I felt so broken and ran off. I just didn't understand how a boy who I thought cared about me could hurt me so badly. I turned into a zombie version of myself. I could barely eat anything, and I refused to go to school as there's no way I could face seeing him with her. In the end, my mom was so concerned about me that she let me change schools. The problem was that it might have been a new school, but it was still full of jerky guys. I started dating this boy called Justin, but then he broke up with me for my friend Rosie. I had to endure sitting alone in the canteen and watching them feed each other yogurt. Gross! I thought that going to college would change my bad luck with guys, and that they'd be more grown up about relationships. But no. Turns out my first college boyfriend, Thomas, was two-timing me the whole time. I was clearly a magnet for bad guys, so I decided to use it to my advantage. In fact, their bad behavior is so predictable that I've managed to build a career on it. So, after I graduated from college with a degree in business administration, I convinced my family to lend me money so I could open up my love trap business. Do you want to find out if your boyfriend's loyal or not? Well, my business can help with that. Hire me and I can tell you if you're wasting your time with that charming guy or if he's one in a zillion. This isn't an investigation service or your regular kind of honey trap company. No. Instead, I help my clients determine if their partner is faithful or not, even before he actually has an affair with someone. Why waste your time and effort with a man who has a wandering eye? It's simple, really. If your partner likes tall brunettes, I'll send a beautiful girl fitting this description over to the place he'll be at. Naturally, I have different service packages to choose from to suit all budgets. For instance, level one is a brief encounter in a chosen location, while level three ups the stakes. Trust me, you guys can resist a super sexy woman. If your boyfriend passed our challenges, congratulations. But if he didn't, then we'd have pictures, videos, and messages to back it up. Of course, my client's discretion was the utmost importance to me. So, if questioned, then my girls would deny being hired, and who by? And they'd never go beyond the limits or allow themselves to develop feelings for the guy. As crazy as it sounds, I was doing really well with this job. Business was booming, and although seeing my clients burst into tears when I handed them pictures of their guy flirting with one of my girls wasn't fun, exposing a cheater made me feel satisfied. Then everything changed when Amy showed up at my office. She seemed like any normal client at first. She loved her boyfriend, but she just wasn't fully sure if she could trust him. A normal, boring case. At least, I thought it was until I opened up the folder with the information about her boyfriend. There, staring back at me, was a picture of Xavier. Whoa, I wasn't expecting that. Still, I kept my cool, smiled sweetly at Amy, and said, Leave it to me. As if I was going to turn down this job and a large sum of money just because I had history with Xavier, Amy didn't know that, and she didn't need to. I'd send another girl along, catch him out, then voila, Amy would see what a jerk he was. Only that evening, I poured myself a glass of wine and looked through his folder. Jeez, I'd forgotten just how handsome he was. By my third glass of wine, I decided that no one knew Xavier better than me. Therefore, I needed to use myself as bait and catch him out. The next evening, I put on my favorite dress and I went to the bar Amy said he'd be at. There he was, sitting at the bar and flirting with the pretty bartender. Some things never change. Then he turned and saw me. He looked shocked and said, Olive, is that you? Oh, hi, Xavier. I smiled bitterly. 
The last time I saw you, weren't you having fun with your new muse in the music room? He looked confused and said he didn't understand what I was talking about, so I gave him a refresher. I thought he'd be ashamed that I caught him out as a cheater, but then he responded, No, you've got the wrong idea. We were just practicing for the school play when she tried to kiss me all of the sudden. I bet you didn't stay until the next moment to see me push her away and tell her I already had my girlfriend. You're my one and only Olive, my muse. Suddenly, I felt so stupid that I didn't ask him directly that day and just ran away without a word. If I had, then I could have had my dream life with him and never had to experience those jerk guys. As I looked into his dreamy eyes, I realized that I still loved him, and I knew he loved me too. That Amy girl wasn't right for him. So when he asked me to go back to a hotel room with him, I didn't think twice about saying yes. After that, we started dating, and it felt good being able to trust a guy again. He was always spoiling me with romantic weekend trips and taking me out to expensive restaurants. But then one night, when I was with him at a hotel, and he was out of the room, his phone beeped, and I saw a message from Amy pop up. So when he returned, I used this as my chance to ask him, Who's Amy? He touched my hand and told me that, she was just some silly girl he was pretending to date so her father's company would hire him for a big job. He promised that after his business contract ended, he wouldn't talk to her again. I'd failed to trust Xavier once before, and I wasn't about to do it again. Also, I need to help him with his business. So when Amy came to my office, I put on a smile and said, Congrats, Xavier's one of the good guys. Is that right? She raised an eyebrow. Then she threw a pile of photos on the table between us. There were pictures of me and Xavier at the bar, at the mall, on a recent short trip away, and in a hotel foyer. Talk about a shocker. It turns out Amy wasn't as naive as I thought she was. She scowled at me and said, Does your place even have rules for going to hotels with the customer's boyfriend to challenge him? Prepare yourself to go to courts, fraudsters. She left, leaving me trembling with fear. I was about to lose my business and it was all my own fault, but at least I still had Xavier, the love of my life, right? I called him up in tears and expected him to comfort me. Instead, he yelled out, You ruined it all, you loser! How dare you let Amy know about your embarrassing affair? Do you really think I'd leave a good girl like Amy for someone awful like you? Prepare for the trial, since my testimony will put you at a disadvantage. Now, I have a ruined career and a dented pride. I'm tired and exhausted, and the last remaining belief in love I had has been lost forever. But worse still, I don't trust myself. I hate the fact that I fell for Xavier's charms, not once, but twice. But if I manage to get through this lawsuit without losing everything, then I want to start a new business. I don't want to be bitter forever. Instead, I want to do something with my life. Something that doesn't involve love, heartbreak, or anything in between, as I'm keeping my heart a no-go zone from now on. Hi, my name is Mia, and I lived the first 14 years of my life trapped in a lie. I never left the house, and by that, I mean never! I grew up believing that I was allergic to the sun, and if I stayed out in it too long, I'd turn to dust. Dumb, I know, but I was just a kid, and I had no reason not to believe what my mom told me. On the rare occasions, I went out into the backyard, and my skin turned all blotchy and puffy. Looking back on it now, it's clear mom had given me something to bring my skin out in a rash, but at the time, I honestly believed the sun was out to get me. I remember peering behind the curtain and watching the kids play out in the street. They looked like they were having so much fun, and I felt so sad that I couldn't join them. Mom charged into my room, quickly closed the curtain, and then she grabbed my shoulders and shouted at me. Mia, never do that again. The sun can come in through the curtains and turn you to a crisp. Is that what you want? I remember sobbing as I shook my head. I never did peer out at the other kids again after that. I could still hear them playing, so I would close my eyes and imagine that I was out there with them, playing chase and learning how to ride a bike. I so wanted that to be my reality. The problem was I didn't have that life. 
Instead, I was stuck inside with no friends. I'd never even touched the grass before. Mom homeschooled me. She took this really seriously and got really mad when I didn't understand something. One time, I gave the wrong answer to a math equation, so she screamed at me. You're such an idiot! I've had enough of you! Then she locked me in my room without dinner. Crazy, huh? But back then, I was so scared that from then, I didn't dare to ask her anything. It's always just mom and me, and no one else in my house. She said my dad had died when I was a baby. Again, I had no reason not to believe her. I never had a phone to talk to anyone, and who did I have to talk to? Still, I remember being fascinated by this strange object she often pressed to her ear. Whenever she was on the phone, I believed she was talking to herself. Mum would lock me in the house while she went out. Then when she returned, she'd just throw me something to eat. A sandwich, a packet of potato chips, and sometimes she changed the meal to bread. She never really cooked. I'm not even sure if she knew how to. My house was a simple old house. There's not many things in it. No TV, no sofa, a basic kitchen. I mean, it looks like an abandoned house, but I thought it was normal because I'd not seen any other houses. My room was small, cold, and dark. I only had a hard mattress and some itchy old pillows. I didn't even have a bed cover. I used to shiver myself to sleep each night and dream of being out there playing with the other kids. Then, things got worse when I turned 10. Mum stormed into my room, gave me some food and a pile of books, and told me that I had to stay in my room from now on so she knew I was safe. I put up with four years of this. It was horrible. She chucked my meals at me and gave me new books once a week. I felt so hungry and lonely all the time. Then one day, when evening arrived and she still hadn't fed me, my hunger pains got the better of me. So I tried the door, and to my surprise, it wasn't locked. So I snuck downstairs. That's when I saw Mom pacing the room, her phone in hand. She said, Yes, I know, Toby. Well, she's finally of age, so when are you coming to get her? Then she said, Tomorrow at 10 a.m. I will be counting the money. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew something wasn't right. Then I heard Mum say, Well, I suppose I better go and feed her then. I quickly darted upstairs and lay on my mattress. Mum appeared and passed me a sandwich and some water. She sat down next to me, which was odd, as she hardly ever did this. And she smiled at me as she said, We need to get you cleaned up, and I've bought you a new dress to wear. Why, Mum? I asked her. Her smile faded into a scowl and she kicked my mattress. Why do you always have to be so insolent? I didn't want to upset her further, so I didn't ask her anything else. Then the next day, Mom made me put the new dress on and let me out of my room. Then there was a knock at the door, and Mom brought this strange man in. I'd never interacted with anyone other than Mom before, so I just sat there, feeling afraid. He was around my mom's age and tall, really tall, and he had unkind eyes. He passed my mom an envelope, and she opened it and took out a lot of bits of paper. I know now that this was money, but back then, I didn't fully understand what it was. Mom counted it out, then nodded at him and said, She's all yours. Right. You're coming with me, sweetie. He walked towards me. Wh what I stared at him, open-mouthed. Mia, you're going to live with this man now. Mom said it like it was no big deal. That's what happens when you turn 14. You have to leave. But mom, why? I don't know him. I won't go. Then she slapped me and shouted out loud, Go with him. I'm done with you. That's when I realized that I couldn't live with this woman anymore. I ran out of the front door. Surely turning to dust was better than living with any of them. Only, as the sun touched my skin, it didn't burn. That's when I knew... Mom had been lying to me all this time, so I started running without knowing where I was going. I could hear Mom and that Toby guy chasing and shouting after me, but I just kept on running. Every little sound freaked me out, as I didn't understand this world and the people in it. The next thing I remember is some woman shaking me and saying, Sweetie, are you okay? I was so afraid at first and curled up into a ball. But then she told me she wasn't going to hurt me, she just wanted to help me. She had kind eyes, not like mom or that man. 
so I told her what had happened. She looked completely shocked, but she rang the police. So it turns out that when I was a baby, I was stolen. My mom isn't really my mom at all. She was some messed up woman who took me out of my pushchair and made some awful deal with that Toby man that he could buy me off her when I was 14. She didn't know my real parents. She just saw a chance to grab me and she took it. It's horrible to think that she robbed me of a normal life, but I try not to dwell on this thought too much. I can't change the past. Then eventually, something amazing happened. My real parents were found. It was so emotional seeing them for the first time. They hugged me and we all just cried. They told me how they'd never stopped looking for me. And guess what? I found out I have a little sister called Izzy. I love hanging out with her and watching her play. She's the best. It's been hard. There's so much I've had to learn, such as how to interact with people and even how to eat with a knife and fork. My real parents have been so kind and patient with me. Now, at the age of 19, I have some sort of normal life. I still find many things confusing, and I struggle being around large crowds. I had to get used to sleeping on a bed, and I find computers the most confusing thing ever. But I manage to function in the big, wide world. As for my fake mom and Toby, well, they were both sentenced for their involvement in my kidnap and are now in jail for a very long time. I have a chance at leading a normal life in the normal world, and even though what happened to me was horrible, I'm not going to let those cruel people ruin my life. I finally have a loving family, and I know that with their care and support, I can get through anything. I was born into a pretty poor family, so money was always on my mind. As I grew up, all I wanted was to have money, and I couldn't wait until I was old enough to start making some of my own. I especially couldn't stand the way people took advantage of others, just to get some quick cash. And yet, it wasn't long before I almost became like one of those gold diggers that I hated so much. I'm Jolie, and I'm 20 years old. You might be wondering why I hate gold diggers. Well, who doesn't? But for starters, my mom was one. Yep, that's right. She ditched me and my dad to marry some rich guy when I was just five years old. I can't even recall her face, but I still remember that day like it was just yesterday. I was screaming and crying and begging her not to leave, but she didn't even look back. Ever since, it's just been me and my dad. Obviously, my dad worked really hard to make enough money to raise me alone, but we were still poor. He worked on construction sites, and the hours were long, so it wasn't long before his health started to go downhill. A lot of his money went towards medical bills, and so we made do with whatever was left. This made me hate my mom so much. She was the most selfish person in the world to me. Dad still encouraged me to focus on my education, though so I ended up going to college to further study Chinese, which I've always been fond for. But after one year, we couldn't afford it anymore, so I decided to quit and find a job to help my dad out. At first, I worked as a waitress, but I was pretty smart, and my Chinese was good, so eventually, I got another job as an interpreter in a big company, where I met John. He was the CEO and also the person who would change my entire life. So there I was working two jobs, and even though I was exhausted, I was happy. I was making enough money to look after my dad, and also had enough left to buy gifts for my boyfriend. Yep, that's right. I had a boyfriend called Scott, and we'd been dating for two years. I felt like the luckiest girl in the world, because he was drop-dead gorgeous. I loved buying him stuff, because it made him so happy. Finally, my life was turning around for the better. But then everything changed in the blink of an eye. I caught Scott cheating on me with some woman the same age as his mom. I couldn't believe it. He used his good looks to date older women just so he could get their money. He was as bad as my mom. Nothing but a gold digger. Though little did I know, I was about to follow in their footsteps. It all started the day I caught him cheating. 
I was so upset and miserable. I'd bumped into them in the mall, where I'd seen them holding hands and kissing, and all I wanted was to get as far away as possible from there. I ran out onto the street, and then I just collapsed onto the sidewalk, and started crying my eyes out. Suddenly, I heard someone say, Jolie? What are you doing here? I looked up, and John, the CEO, was standing there. I tried to stop the tears, but I couldn't. I couldn't even speak. He helped me up and told me to get in the car and go somewhere so I could calm myself down. Then we ended up in a bar, and I drank a lot. I couldn't stop myself from telling him about what Scott had done. John comforted me, and then, the next moment, I woke up and John was lying next to me. I was about to freak out, but John looked at me and smiled and said that if I hung out with him from time to time, like this, then he'd subsidize everything for me so that I could go back to college and pay my tuition. I was shocked. He said it had to be our secret so that his wife didn't find out. I was about to say no way, but the thought of being able to finish my studies and graduate made me consider it again. And after all, John was being so sweet, and me and my dad could really use that extra money. So the next moment, I found myself nodding my head, and the rest was history. I had officially become John's secret lover, aka a gold digger. And let me tell you, my life got so much easier. I went back to college and had more time to enjoy life. But at the same time, I couldn't shake off the guilt, especially when I thought about John's wife. I'd never met her before, but I knew from working at John's company that her name was Doris, and that she was the perfect wife. I even found out that they didn't have kids because Doris was infertile, after some accident. This made me feel so bad. How had I let myself become a mistress like this? It wasn't right. But still, I couldn't just end things with John. You see, I'd actually started to fall in love with him. Yes. You can say I was a gold digger, but I also had real feelings for him. And so did he. He took care of me, and I was happy with him. It was only natural that I'd start loving him. And so, even though I knew what we were doing was wrong, I couldn't stop it. Then one day, I was walking to the bus stop when a random man approached me and said that Doris wanted to meet me. Oh my god, Doris knew about me? I felt so sick suddenly. He said she wanted to meet me right away, and so I followed him to a nearby cafe where she was waiting. As soon as I saw her, my jaw dropped. I knew her. It was the woman Scott had cheated on me with. No way! I couldn't believe my eyes! When she saw me, she looked shocked. But then she said, Well, well, well. Looks like we're destined to meet. Okay? I'll get straight to the point. You need to back away from my husband. What? Clearly, Doris wasn't the perfect wife everyone made her out to be. I said to her, You do know you're no better than me, right? I wonder what John would say if he knew you were having an affair too. She was furious. She started shouting at me, saying John would never leave her, and that she would not let me steal him away, especially his money, and that it all belonged to her then she stormed off. Surprise, surprise, she was just with John for his money. She was even worse than me. At least I loved him. After that meeting, the war between Doris and I officially began. She started to rub in my face that she was his wife, and I wasn't. Every day, she'd turn up at the office with his lunch and kiss him in front of me. Honestly, it made me sick. No, really, like literally sick. But no luck for her, the universe works in funny ways. And guess what? I was pregnant. And this was one thing I could give John that Doris couldn't. I was so happy. I called John right away. He was over the moon and promised to take care of me and the kid. He started spending more time with me after that. But one day when we were together, Doris called and said she was sick. I couldn't stand her interrupting our special time like this, so I pretended to have stomach pains, and he immediately drove me to the hospital and asked their maid to go take care of Doris. Ha! Huh, I'd won this time. But then something shocking happened. 
Doris appeared in front of my house. When would she give up? I walked towards her and asked, What else do you want now? She was about to say something, but suddenly, my dad came out from the house and said, Jolie, what are you doing? So both me and Doris turned back and, well, that's when things got crazier. Doris? My dad shouted in surprise. He looked like he'd seen a ghost. Then Doris said, Thomas? How did they know each other? Well, the next thing, my dad was screaming. Get away from her. She's not your daughter anymore. I froze. Doris was... My mom? Before I could even say anything, she ran to her car and drove off. I didn't even want to see my dad. I just wanted to be alone. That night, I lay awake all night thinking about it all. I'd been competing with my mom? This was so wrong. What was I going to do? I loved John, and I wanted to have his baby so badly. But he was my mom's husband. And then, all those old feelings of abandonment came flooding back. My mom had left us, and now she was hurting John. She just took advantage of our love and only cared about money. She didn't care about any of us. Why could she be so selfish? I couldn't stop crying. Everything was such a mess. Eventually, I fell asleep, and when I woke up, I knew what I had to do. Even though she was my mom, she needed to learn a lesson once and for all. I called John and asked if we could meet at our favorite cafe. I was so nervous, but I told him everything. How she cheated on him, and then how she was my mom. I even showed him some photos of her with Scott that I'd taken outside Scott's house. John was so shocked, he just stared at me, not saying anything. He looked completely heartbroken and I wanted to hug and comfort him, but I knew I couldn't do that anymore. In the end, John divorced Doris and kicked her out of the house, leaving her with nothing. And then, you won't believe it, he proposed to me. What did I say? Well, I'm still deciding. Becoming the wife of my mom's ex-husband just feels a bit strange. My mom has suffered a lot already. I'm not sure I want to make her even more miserable. But... Let's see. All I know is that I'm going to give birth soon and raise this baby in the best way I can. I'm definitely going to be a better mom than my mom was. That's for sure. Hi, I'm Ella, and I'm 17. Have you ever been brave enough to change the things that you were too familiar with? If yes, did you encounter any difficulties? Well, for me, yeah. It's more than just changes. And this is the story of what happened to me last summer. And it's really crazy, so brace yourself. So, I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. When I say small, I mean it. It only had a population of 85 people. There was just one gas station, two small parks, one grocery store, and, oh yeah, only one school. Including me, there were only seven kids in my grade. That's right, seven people. And my grade was one of the biggest ones. From when I was five years old to the time I was 15, I spent most of my time with the same six classmates. After being with them for many years... Most of them really started to get on my nerves. Well, apart from Rosie. Rosie and I became BFFs in third grade. Some other kids were teasing me about my red hair and told me that I looked like a tomato. But then Rosie appeared by my side and told them to back off. From then on, we became best friends and were pretty much inseparable. My life was good. I felt safe in my little town where everyone knew each other. In a city, there were way too many people for my liking, and too much pressure to be popular, and I didn't want that. I knew a small town life was the life for me. But then, when I was 16, everything changed. On one Saturday afternoon, I was at Rosie's house watching a movie when my parents called me and told me to come home at once. I thought this was kind of weird because my parents didn't usually call me to come home until it was late at night. And right now, it was only 4.30 p.m. What did they need me to come home for? 
I arrived home to find Jake, my brother, crying. I bursted out loud. What happened? What was going on? Seeing me totally in shock, my dad said, Ella, we have some news. What news was bad enough to make my brother, who wasn't the emotional type, cry? Did someone have a serious illness? Had someone died? Oh, no. Had my beloved dog Sally died? Then he said, Ella, I've been offered a job in New York City. What? I yelled. And he's taking it. This is an amazing opportunity for us all. And moving out of this town will be good for us. It'll be a great adventure, Mom said. New York? The biggest city in the entire country? No, I couldn't move there. I didn't want a new adventure. I was perfectly happy where we live now, and I didn't want to leave. But however much I sulked, shouted, or pleaded with my parents to stay, their minds were made up, and we were moving. Telling Rosie was horrible. She got so upset, and I felt awful about it. I didn't want to leave her, but what choice did I have? I spent my last day in town with her. We ate pizza, watched our favorite movies, played our favorite video games, and things like that. When it was time for me to leave, I gave her my unicorn plushie to remember me by. Then we cried into each other's arms and we promised to text each other every single day. So, I left the safety of my little town and moved to the city. Our new house was much smaller than my old one, but at least we could keep Sally. On my first day of school, I was terrified. There were so many people and I didn't know where I was meant to go or what I was meant to do. Luckily, the kids there were actually really nice. This one girl showed me where my locker was, and some other kids let me sit with them at lunchtime. After only a few weeks of living in New York, I started to find my bearings. I even figured out how to navigate the underground. I made some pretty great friends, but this didn't change the fact that Rosie was still my BFF. I texted her every day, and sometimes we spent hours on the phone with each other. A month of city life passed and I got talking to this boy in my English class called Alex. He had the most amazing blonde hair, and his eyes, they were blue like the sky and the ocean and a swimming pool and, yeah, if you couldn't tell, I really liked Alex. Not only was he unbelievably cute, but he was also kind and funny. We bonded over our love of video games and dogs and soon became pretty close. Then one day, he invited me over to his apartment to hang out. Then over a giant pizza and a movie, he told me he liked me and asked me to be his girlfriend. I instantly said yes! I was so excited and couldn't wait to tell Rosie, but she didn't seem all that thrilled about it. For a few months, everything was perfect for me. School life was great and I had some awesome friends and an amazing boyfriend. Sadly though, Rosie and I grew further apart. I barely had time to talk to her hours on the phone every night. It was like our timeline became different. She always called when I was busy, and when I texted her back, she wasn't there. I know that she always cared about me, but my busy life just carried me away. I told myself this was okay as things change. People get different friends. Though not as often as before, Rosie and I still chatted whenever we had a chance. One time I told her that I would be going out with Alex at a fancy restaurant the next day. Anytime I mentioned Alex, she seemed not cool with it. But that time she expressed her excitement and asked me a lot about our date. That made me feel so good. When the day came, I went to meet Alex at the restaurant that he had booked for us. I entered and waited for about 20 minutes for him to show. I began to get impatient and asked a waiter if he'd seen a boy with blonde hair and blue eyes come in at all. The waiter told me he had, but he'd left with a tall girl with long brown hair and brown eyes. What? Who was the girl he left with? And why? I thought of everyone I knew who fit that description. I couldn't think of anyone. Except for Rosie. But she lived in Pennsylvania. Why would she be here talking to my boyfriend? I decided to call Alex, but he sounded muffled and I heard a girl talking in the background. It sounded like they were arguing and then the call ended. This was so weird. What happened? I had no idea what was going on, so I headed home. On my way, I felt like someone was following me. And then I realized that there was one car driving very slowly after me. When I tried stopping, it also stopped. Oh 
my God, was it having anything to do with me? I felt terrified and started to run as quick as I could until I reached my house. I turned back and saw that car parked outside my house. I was shaking as I tried to open the door. And as I did, Sally zoomed past me and ran toward the car. I had only seen her act that way whenever Alex came over. She really liked Alex. Wait, Alex? That was it. Alex was in that car. Was it a prank? I ran over to see what the heck was going on. There, sitting in the driver's seat, was Rosie. And to my complete shock, Alex was tied up in the back seat. Rosie! I screamed. What are you doing here in New York with my boyfriend? Alex screamed, Help! She told me you were waiting for me in her car, then she kidnapped me. Rosie quickly turned around and looked me right in the face. Oh, um, hi, Ella. What are you doing with my boyfriend? He's not a good guy for you, Ella. I need you to break up with him now, or else I will drive away so you can never find him ever. Are you crazy? We will not break up just because you demand me to do that. Now let him go. I walked around to the passenger door to get Alex, but then the car started moving fast. I ran after the car, but I was too slow. But Sally ran after it too, and she didn't stop. She almost got hit by cars as she ran through traffic until she was out of sight. I was so scared. I was about to call the cops when I saw a police car zoom past me. How did they know about this already? Who called 911? I looked back and saw my mom standing outside with the phone waving at me nervously. She had seen all the commotion and called the cops. Thanks, Mom. There was nothing I could do now except wait. It was awful. I was so anxious. About an hour later, a cop car pulled up to our house. The cop stepped out and opened the back door and... Out came Sally. I ran up to the police car and hugged Sally. She was safe. But what about Alex? The officer told me that they'd chased the car for almost two miles until they cornered it on a dead-end street. He said that Rosie was very fierce and tried resisting arrest, but they'd taken her to the station. To my relief, Alex was fine, and they dropped him back home. Phew. I just didn't understand it. Rosie was my best friend. Why would she try to seriously harm my boyfriend? I later found out that Rosie was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. It's a disorder that causes people to go through extreme mood swings and do things that are out of character and crazy. Rosie had a lot going on. As well as me not being around anymore, her dad had moved out. I didn't know this as she hadn't told me. Back then, I wasn't talking all that much to her. But I'd never expected that the separation Rosie felt was too much for her and could lead her to bipolar disorder. I was her only one at that time. So she wanted her to be my only one too. But Alex appeared and made her feel insecure and seriously jealous. It is fortunate there are no serious consequences. I really hope Rosie gets the proper treatment for her disorder. We might not be as close anymore, but in my eyes, she'll always be the girl who was there for me when I was being teased. And I will always regret that I wasn't there to listen to her more when she needed me. I still feel sad about it all, but I'm trying to see the positives. Things with Alex are going great, and I'm happy here. It turns out city life is for me after all. Whether it's in friendship or love, people still need their own space. And sometimes, as sad as it is, people do grow apart. This happens in life. Being overjealous doesn't help mend things. It just pushes the other person further away. Hey, it's Jessica. From the outside, my life seemed perfect. My family is wealthy, I'm beautiful, shining bright, and even my job is fancy. But from the inside, I do have a character flaw. It's my short temper that almost caused me to lose everything. I've always been daddy's little princess, which means that anything I want, I have to get, such as new clothes, a new car, and exotic vacations. Because of this, other girls have always been jealous of me. But Kath was different. She realized there's so much more to me than my designer outfits and glossy hair. Kathy's family lived nearby. You see, my dad was friends with Kath's father, who passed away when she was little. But being the nice guy my dad is, he continued to support them. 
He paid for Kath's education, so we went to the same school. She was the only friend who could handle my short temper. I know, that wasn't nice, but it was hard dealing with the average girl's jealousy toward me. As a result, there were a few incidents. One time, when I was just a primary student, some girl dared to put on my shirt after sports. She said it was an accident, but as if. I yelled at her that she'd stretched it, and now she owed me a new one. Kath tried to defuse the situation, but she just got caught up in the middle of the shouting match. Literally, as me and this girl were screaming insults at each other across Kath. Then another time, some kids sat in my seat in the canteen, and when I asked them to move, they refused to. I was fuming, so I poured my custard all over them. Seeing as the kids were about to get crazy, Kath passed them a napkin, hurriedly apologized to them, then led me out of there before I covered them in more of my lunch. She understood how mad I got on things, but never got annoyed at me about it. This is why our friendship continued into adulthood. It was perfect to have a friend like Kath to grow up with, but what made my life even more perfect was the arrival of our boy next door. Yes, a new family had just moved in, and my mom told me that a cute boy my age was going around meeting people. I ran out to suss it out and find Kath standing on her front porch and talking to a super cute guy. I swished out my hair and tottered over to them. Hi, Kath. I smiled at her. Then I turned to him and said, Hi there. We definitely haven't met before, because there's no way I'd forget you. He smiled back and introduced himself as Andrew and said he lived on that block. I sat down on the couch in Kath's house and did my research on Andrew and found out he was a pretty famous influencer. His dad ran off with another woman and started a new family, so Andrew lives with his mom and Nan. And best of all, he was single. I pulled on Kath's arm and insisted that she help me bag Andrew as my man. She looked a little awkward at first, but then she reluctantly agreed to help. I persuaded Kath to pretend that she lost her phone, then I went round to Andrew's and begged him to come and help us look for it. He spent the whole afternoon trying to help us look for it, only to hear it buzzing in my pocket. Oops. Then one time, well, this wasn't planned, but I managed to get one of my new heels stuck in a drain cover. I was standing there yelling at it when Andrew walked past and told me to take my shoe off. I refused. Did he have any idea how expensive they were? He just laughed and told me to lean on him while he carefully unwedged my shoe whose heart wouldn't melt for this gentle guy. After that, we started to talk more, and then chatted every day. He had a sense of humor, and was very gentle toward me. It is so wonderful to know that he was impressed by how cute I was, hiding Kat's phone in my pocket to find a chance to make friends. How embarrassing, but seemed like he liked that. After two months, he asked me out on a date, and soon, we became an official couple. I loved being around his family, as his mom and grandma were so sweet and friendly. Then my dad said he needed me to go on a three-month business trip in San Diego. I didn't want to leave Andrew for so long, but there was nothing I could do about it. Ugh, being an adult sucked sometimes. I just had to pack up and take a flight to San Diego, then finish the job as quickly as possible. Little did I know how terrible things could happen in the next three months. One night, my mom called me up. She was furious, and at first, I couldn't work out what she was saying. Finally, she calmed down enough for me to make her words out. Jess, I found the DNA test hidden away in one of your father's filing cabinets. Kath is his biological daughter. This whole time, he's been lying to us. I cannot put up with this. I'm divorcing him, and I won't be happy until he's left with nothing. What? Kath was my sister? No, it couldn't be. I called up Kath to get to the bottom of this. As soon as she picked up, I screamed at her. Your dad's my dad. How could you keep this a secret? You're trash, and so's your mom. You're both vile, ugly gold diggers, and I hate you both. Kath spluttered out. W what Huh? I don't understand. You heard me. You're trash, and so's your mom. She's nothing more than a man-eating, money-obsessed liar, and I hate her! Sobbing, Kath replied, Don't talk about my mom like that. 
This only made me angrier, so I yelled, I will say what I want to. I hate you and I hate her. I hope you both fall down a pothole and never get out. Suddenly, I heard a voice say in the background, Who are you talking to? And why are you so upset? I knew that voice. It was Andrew's. Why was he with Kath? I was about to scream out at her to stay away from my man, but she hung up. I immediately tried calling Andrew, but he didn't answer. I was so angry, I screamed out, then went into the kitchen and started smashing glasses onto the floor and swiping things out of the cupboards. The next day, Andrew called me. I thought he was going to try and worm his way out of what he did, so I answered with a, Oh, hi, Andrew. It's nice to finally hear from you. He replied, Um, hi, Jess. Look, I have something important to tell you. Um, it's my grandma. She's in the hospital, and I can't afford the medical bills. I hate asking, but please, could I borrow some money? Furious, I yelled, Who do you think you are? You did the dirty behind my back, and now you have the cheek to ask for my help? It's none of my business, dude. He fell silent, then hung up. At first, I was fuming. How dare he do that to me? But once I had time to calm down, I thought maybe I had overreacted a tiny bit. I mean, I could have given him a chance to explain, so I tried calling him again, but he didn't answer. I called Kath, and in my calmest voice, I asked her to tell me what was going on. She said she had no idea that my dad was also her real dad, and it was a lot for her to process. Then she said that she was only around at Andrew's last night because his grandma had a fever, and she was trying to help. But then her fever worsened, so she was taken to the hospital. I felt pretty bad about it all, so I tried calling Andrew again to sort all this mess out. But he'd blocked my number. I transferred him some money over towards his grandma's expenses, but he sent it straight back to me. <sighs> it was so hard being so far away from Andrew and not being able to go and talk things through with him. I missed him like crazy. Because of this, I confided in Kath Lodes, and she kept me in the loop about how Andrew's grandma was. Apparently, she wasn't well at all. Then, one day, she came up with an idea to help. She told me to send money to her account, and she'd give it to Andrew, and tell him it was from her. Then, when his grandma was better, she'd tell Andrew the truth about where the money came from, and he was sure to realize how much I cared for him and forgive me. I thought this was a great idea, so I sent Kath the money. Then things got weird. She went super quiet and then stopped talking to me altogether. Then two months later, through social media, I found out that Andrew was getting married. To Kath! What? After having a screaming frenzy, I calmed down enough to book a flight home. I took an Uber to Andrew's house and pounded on his door. He answered, and on seeing me, he slammed the door in my face. I wasn't leaving until he spoke to me, so I sat on his doorstep. It was only when it started to rain that he eventually opened the door, and in a gruff tone said, Okay, you have two minutes. Then I want you off my property for good. Look, I know you're mad, and I'm sorry, but why are you ignoring me? I tried to make amends for what I did. I sent you the money. I know. I sent it straight back, remember? He grunted. Not that money. The money that Kath gave to you and said was from me. What? That money was from her, not you. You're jealous. You found out I was marrying her, and you're here to ruin our lives. No, no, I'm not. Please, it was me. I wanted to help. I pleaded, but he tutted, then slammed the door again. I stood there, a soggy mess, and his words sunk in. Kath had lied to Andrew about the money. Why would she do that? Furious, I stormed around to her house and was about to press the buzzer down until she answered when the door opened, and I saw Kath stepping out with Andrew's mom. I jumped out of sight and listened. Andrew's mom was thanking her for all her help and saying how much she couldn't wait for her to be her daughter-in-law. What? As soon as his mom walked off, I jumped out of hiding and confronted Kath. You're a liar. Kath was surprised seeing me, but then she just shrugged and said, Whatever, then walked toward her door. 
He's my man now, not yours, she added, looking back at me. You traitor! I screamed at her as I charged towards her. We got into a fight, and there was a lot of hair pulling. Finally, Kath managed to get through her entrance door and lock me out. She grinned at me through the window, so I shouted at her. Kath, you just wait! You won't get away with this! A few days passed, and their wedding day arrived. It was in some super swanky golf resort. I tried sneaking in through the entrance, but two guards stopped me. Ugh! Kath must have pre-warned them about me. So I had to find another way in, which involved climbing through a tiny gap in the hedge. A bodycon dress wasn't my best choice, and I had twigs in my hair and grass stains all over me. Still, out of breath, I showed up at the aisle and waved the evidence of bank statements and messages between me and Kath in Andrew's face, and shouted, Look! This is all the proof you need to show that I sent the money to Kath to help your grandma, and she's a filthy liar! Andrew looked shocked, but he took the evidence from me. No, she's making it up! Kath's eyes widened in alarm as she tried to grab the evidence out of Andrew's hands. Seeing her reaction, he pulled it away from her and looked through it, his face falling when he discovered the truth. How could you lie to me about this? He stared at her. You told me that Jess cut all contact with you. Teary-eyed, Kath glared at me and said, You get everything! The nice clothes and the lavish lifestyle, yet you act like a spoiled brat! I was sick of hiding in your shadow and defending you for all your childish outbursts! I liked Andrew from the beginning, but no, you had to have him! Through gritted teeth, Andrew told her, It's over, Kath. I never want to see you ever again. After that, she rushed up the aisle in a frenzy of white fabric and sobs. Jeez, talk about making an exit. That was three months ago, and a lot has changed since then. My dad eventually managed to persuade Mum to forgive him, although he had to buy her a new car and take her on a month-long island getaway. Also, she insisted that she never wanted to see Kath or her mom ever again, so Dad arranged for them to move to another city. This worked for me, as I never wanted to see Kath again either. I know I have a short temper, and I overreact sometimes, but I honestly believed that Kath was my friend. It hurt knowing that she didn't care about me at all. She just wanted my life. As for Andrew and me, now we're back together and there's no way I'm letting my short temper cause me to lose him again. All of this could have been avoided if I hadn't let my anger blindside me. I should have trusted him from the start and heard him out. So now, if I feel anger overtaking my thoughts, I will go and pace the yard first to calm down. I may look like a crazy person, but it works a treat. Would you ever let yourself become so wrapped up in hatred that you change your entire life to get revenge on someone? Well, that's exactly what I did, and it didn't exactly go to plan. I'm Clara, and I'm 25 years old. It all started five years ago when my boyfriend Jason went to study abroad in France. We were so in love at that time, and it wasn't easy being apart, but we coped surprisingly well. Jason even promised me we'd get married when he got back. But after a few short months of him being away, he started growing distant. He no longer called me every day, and he barely even replied to my texts. I thought maybe he was just too busy and stressful to deal with his new life while struggling with missing me. So I decided to do something wild and fly to Paris to surprise him on his upcoming birthday. I hadn't really thought about it, I just excitedly got on the flight and taken a taxi to his apartment. But, well, the moment I saw him walking into the lobby, I instantly regretted it. There Jason was, but he wasn't alone. He was hugging and kissing some other girl, and she even went upstairs with him. I felt my blood boil, and I wanted to scream, but instead, I just left. I was so upset, but I was also angry. How could he betray me like that? Going a long way just to see my boyfriend betraying me right in front of my eyes was a bad thing, and I didn't think life could get any worse. But I was wrong. Things were about to get much worse. 
After leaving his place, I booked myself into a nearby hostel and cried myself to sleep. The next moment, I was waking up to a burning smell. Oh god, the hostel was on fire! I was lucky to make it out of there alive, but I was badly burned and left with a huge scar on my face. There I was, heartbroken and burnt to a crisp in a foreign country where I knew no one and didn't speak the language. I'd never been so lonely and ugly in my life. As I looked in the mirror, all I felt was anger and resentment towards Jason. He destroyed my life, and at all costs, I would make him pay for it. After I'd recovered, I got on the plane and flew back to the USA. That's when I started plotting my revenge. I had a few things up my sleeve, but first things first. Plastic surgery. So... As soon as I graduated, I got myself a full face rework. I even changed my name, moved to a new apartment, and lived with a new identity. My life was miserable enough, so now all I wanted was to start all over again. And it worked. After the surgery, I turned into a completely different person. Just like I'd wanted. And what's more, I was even more beautiful than before the accident. I felt incredible and couldn't wait to start living again. Of course, I had to work my ass off to pay off my plastic surgery, but it was worth it, wasn't it? More than that, that was also how I tried my best to build a career for myself. Jason would regret cheating on me for the rest of his life, that's for sure. And as planned, after three years of working hard, I eventually got promoted to a management position in the construction company I worked for and became a beautiful, successful woman that many people admired. At the same time, a few of my friends mentioned that Jason had finally returned from Paris and was now working for a big architectural firm. I almost laughed when I heard the company's name. That was our new partner company. Oh, things were about to get fun. My friends also told me that he'd brought his French girlfriend back to the USA with him and that they were getting married soon. What? He was about to get married? They seemed so happy together, huh? No wonder that for all these years, he hadn't tried to contact me once. After I caught him cheating, I just disappeared. I could have been dead for all he knew. But he didn't seem to care. This made me hate him even more. There was no way a traitor could live happily like that. I couldn't wait any longer. It was time to put my plan into action. So I told my boss I'd work on the project with Jason's firm. At least this way, I'd have an excuse to approach him. At that first meeting, I made sure I looked as beautiful as possible and waited with bated breath. Of course, Jason didn't recognize me. And well, 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 would you believe it? He kept looking at me and flirting with me. I found it hilarious and so kept flirting back. And eventually he got the hint and asked me out. What a jerk! Now I understood why I was abandoned in the past. Even when he already had his fiancée, he could still flirt leisurely with others. His poor fiancée. I kept playing along, and even made plans to befriend his fiancée, Valerie. I knew she hung out in a certain cafe, so one day I went there and accidentally bumped into her, dropping water all over her gorgeous outfit. I kept apologizing and told her I'd pay to get it dry cleaned, and eventually we started chatting and hit it off. We exchanged numbers, and I asked if she'd like to go shopping sometime, which she agreed to. This was way too easy. A few days later, we went shopping, and it didn't take long before she started confiding in me about how lonely she was, and that other than her boyfriend, she didn't know anyone here. I smiled sweetly and told her I'd happily be her best friend. At the same time, Jason and I were dating. I pretended to fall for him, even though inside, I was furious at him. I even told him I'd share some confidential work documents with him if he pampered me and treated me like a princess. He seemed totally in love with me and spent all his spare time taking me out to dinner and buying me expensive gifts. It seemed like he was no longer interested in Valerie. Obviously, Valerie came to me and told me that she was very sad because the wedding was coming soon, but her fiancé was just cold and acting weird. On the one hand, I comforted and encouraged her, but on the other hand, I seduced Jason 
and took most of his money. He'd even put my name on the house contract. So technically, I owned his place. You know, I wanted Jason to feel the pain of being betrayed by the person he trusted. Then one day, Valerie called me in tears and said she suspected her boyfriend was seeing someone else. I asked her what her boyfriend's name was and where he worked and said she didn't need to worry. I'd help her find out. A few days later, I sent Valerie a few photos of him cheating with me, but obviously, I hid my face. However, it was just enough evidence to make her suffer. Then I told Valerie that it looked like her boyfriend was working with this other girl on a project, and that Valerie could get her revenge by destroying the project. That way, he wouldn't be able to work with this other girl anymore. Valerie totally fell for it. It was insane! The very next day, I heard from my colleagues that Jason's crazy fiancé had destroyed the final layout for the design of the two companies' project. She spilled water on his laptop and threw it onto the ground. While the deadline was coming, it was too late to start it over. Apparently, Jason's boss was fuming and fired him immediately. This contract was worth millions of dollars, and he'd just ruined everything. I had to give it to Valerie. She didn't even think about it. That's how dumb she was. <laughs> Serve Jason right. Finally, karma had come and bitten him in the ass. That evening, I went over to their house. Jason now has no job, no money, and he was about to lose his fiance and his house too. I knocked on the door, and when Valerie opened it, she was shocked to see me, but not as shocked as she was about to become. Jason saw me and looked like he was going to pass out. Surprise! I said, Hi, Jason. At this, Valerie looked confused and said, Wait, do you two know each other? I just laughed and said, We sure do, Valerie. In fact, I'm the other woman who he is cheating on you with. And that's not all. I'm actually Jason's ex. Then I turned to Jason. That's right, Jason. It's me, Clara. Valerie, when he came to Paris, he was dating me and then he cheated on me with you, so I've been getting my sweet revenge. Both of them looked completely stunned, and instead of shouting at me, they started fighting with each other. Valerie was screaming. How could you? Jason shouted back. You're crazy. If you hadn't ruined my laptop, things wouldn't have been like this. Oh, really? If you hadn't cheated on me, I wouldn't have done that, Valerie said, while bursting out crying. Pretty soon, she found out that the house belonged to me now, and all of his money, and that's when all hell broke loose. I just stood there, admiring how great my revenge had played out. Eventually, they broke up with each other, and I decided to kick them out of the house. So my cherished revenge plan for the past few years has been successful. However, there was just one problem. The price I paid for it wasn't small. When I showed up at work the next day, everyone was whispering about me, saying the project I'd been working on had been a complete failure, and that it was all because I seduced the guy from our partner firm, even when he was about to marry his fiance. It was a disaster. My reputation was ruined. I couldn't handle everyone being against me, so I resigned. I decided to spend some time at home for a while, trying to clear my head. I didn't get it. I'd spent years plotting my revenge, and now that it had finally been a success, why did I feel so bad? I'd been so caught up in ruining Jason's life. I hadn't thought how it would affect my life too. I'd been delusional. Above all, the joy and satiety of watching the two of them move out of the house was just temporary. And what remained after that was just a feeling of emptiness. What had I been doing? I was just ruining people's lives. Especially with Valerie. She was so innocent in all of this. How could I have been so cruel? Then one day, as I was walking down the street, I saw her at the bus stop, and she looked so sad and thin, and it tormented me. That poor girl didn't deserve this. I couldn't just stand there and do nothing. I had to apologize, so I raced across the street. But by the time I got there, the bus had come, and she had gone. I decided to call her instead. I asked if we could talk, and at first, she refused. But once I said sorry and told her how terrible I felt about everything, she agreed to meet me. I was holding the keys to her old house, and as she walked towards me, I handed them over. 
She was surprised, but then I started to explain. Valerie, I'm so sorry. I didn't want to hurt you. It's just that Jason broke my heart, and for years, all I thought about was destroying his life the way he destroyed mine. I didn't realize you were so sweet, and now I see how awful I was to you. You don't deserve any of this. You trusted me, and I completely betrayed you. At first, Valerie didn't say anything. Then, she started shouting at me, saying she'd thought of me as her best friend, and that she felt so pathetic for trusting me. At this point, I burst into tears. I was a monster. The minute I started crying, something changed in Valerie. She hugged me. I couldn't believe it. After everything I'd done to her, she still wanted to hug me. We were there hugging and crying, and yep, finally something good had come out of all this mess. I had a friend, and very quickly, this friend will become my best friend for sure. You guys, honestly, I don't recommend wasting your time on revenge. I threw away so many years of my life obsessing over hurting Jason, and in the end, it just hurt me and poor innocent Valerie. From my own experience, I just want to tell you that always be the bigger person and live for yourself, not for others. Hi everyone, I'm Emma and this is my story about what can happen when someone gets so jealous of you, they try to ruin your life. It all started with my mom. She's a beautiful woman and I took after her. So when she divorced my dad and we moved to a new town, obviously I started a new school. That's when the trouble began. I became popular very quickly, but not with the girls. It was the boys who went wild for me and it drove me crazy. I just wanted a normal life with some nice friends and it wasn't my fault my mom had passed her beauty down to me. Anyway, there was one girl in particular called Anna who was having none of it. She was also pretty, but she was seriously jealous of me from day one. I remember that first week hearing some girls whispering in the bathroom that I was prettier than Anna. And then Anna walked in and she looked like she wanted to scream. After that, she went out of her way to destroy my life. At my old school, I'd been a cheerleader, so I signed up to join at this new school. Little did I know, Anna was head cheerleader. She pretended to be all nice to me at practice. Then at the first football game we were performing and going through our routine which Anna had choreographed, she made me go at the top of the pyramid, balancing on top of everyone. I was so nervous, but I knew I could do it. Anyway, as I was climbing up there, I suddenly saw Anna whisper to the girl next to her and then she moved and the whole pyramid started to fall. She obviously wanted to hurt me but it backfired and we all fell on top of her. All we heard was a scream as her arm snapped. Afterwards she told everyone I was clumsy and it was all my fault but I knew she'd planned it so I'd be the one to get hurt. And that's not all. Prom was coming up and my mom had made me the most beautiful long silk dress. I felt like a princess and couldn't wait to see what everyone would think. Of course Anna was also wearing a beautiful dress but everyone was staring at me. I saw her roll her eyes, and then when I was dancing with two of my friends, I felt something rip. I looked behind me, and Anna was standing on my dress. I couldn't believe it. I tried to move, but she wouldn't budge, and it wouldn't stop ripping. Suddenly, I was standing there with a mini dress, and I wanted to cry. But then my friend quickly got some scissors and kneaded it up. And believe it or not, it actually looked even cooler than before. <laughs> Once again, Anna tried to make me look like a fool, but it all fell on her. Everyone was so impressed with my dress and I even started a new trend wearing mini dresses to prom. However, despite all these silly pranks, there was one thing that Anna had that I didn't. A boyfriend. She was dating Isaac one of the top athletes in school and anytime she was with him and saw me she would always smirk and look me up and down as if to say she had a boyfriend and I didn't. I didn't care for her silly competitiveness though. I wasn't even bothered about being single all I wanted was for her to leave me alone. Pretty soon we became like enemies. I just couldn't stand her and her annoying behaviors but then things got worse. 
One weekend, my mom drove me to a game and insisted on staying to watch my cheerleading performance. Later, I spotted her chatting with some men and she looked like she was having a good time. I was happy to see her smile that brightly after a long time. And as expected, not long after that, she introduced him to me. But you won't believe who it was. It turned out he was Anna's dad out of all people on earth. And worse still, they were now hopelessly in love and even wanted to get married. Oh no! If I knew who he was, I would have broken them up from the start. I couldn't be Anna's stepsister. This was my worst nightmare. And when Anna found out about this, she started to treat me even worse. One time, I was walking in the canteen when suddenly someone pushed me. I went flying and ended up bumping into a boy who fell over too. It was so sore, but the pain quickly disappeared when I realized who the boy was. It was Liam, the new Hawkeye who just joined the athletes club. I kept apologizing to him, but he just laughed and said it was okay. Then helped me get up and took me to the nurse's office to make sure I wasn't hurt. Afterwards, he even asked for my number. I couldn't believe it. I was actually blushing over a boy. Then I went back to the canteen and there was Anna staring at me all angry. I didn't even have to think twice about who'd push me. Obviously, Anna. Well, thanks to her silly prank, now I had a cute guy interested in me. And for once, I was actually interested in him too. It didn't take long before we became a couple. And then we were pretty much attached at the hip. I also joined his athlete's practice. And because Isaac was there too, Anna was always there as well. She just glared at me with dagger eyes whenever she saw me. I didn't get what her problem was. Anyway, one time, the athletes club suggested we all go see a movie, with girlfriends included. In the theater, Anna sat behind me and kept kicking my chair. I turned over and asked her to stop, but she wouldn't. I could feel the anger welling up inside me and I thought I was going to explode. But I didn't want to embarrass myself in front of Liam. So, I decided I needed to stay as far away from Anna as possible. That wasn't easy though. Our school had organized a big athletes competition with another school and so Liam was always practicing. I always sat in the stands and watched him and on the day of the competition Anna came and sat next to me. I almost froze. What was she up to? Instead of pulling some prank she handed me a bottle of water and said, Hey Emma, I don't want to be your enemy anymore. We're basically going to be sisters so let's just make up okay? Then she turned to me and smiled shyly. Whoa, well that was a surprise. I felt relieved though and said, I thought this day would never come. I hated things being all awkward between us. Anna just smiled at me again. And then we came down to the field where Isaac and Liam were warming up for the race to wish them luck. Finally, the competition began. Anna and I sat together cheering our boyfriends on. As expected, Liam won first prize and Isaac came in second. I was so happy for Liam and ran out to the field to hug him. But suddenly, some of the organizers approached him and escorted him off the field. I had no idea what was going on, but I saw Anna smirking at me and then walking away. What was that for? After a while, the organizers came back and said Liam had been caught doping. So now the first prize would go to Isaac. What? There was no way Liam would do something illegal like that. He'd never used any kind of substance to perform well. He was just naturally talented. Everyone started saying mean things about Liam and I couldn't bear it. So I went to find him. I saw him sitting in the corner of the locker room looking shocked. When he saw me, he shook his head and said, I didn't use doping. You have to believe me, Emma. I'm not that kind of guy. All I did was drink the water you gave me. Oh my god, the water bottle! Anna had given it to me and I must have passed it on to Liam to hydrate before the competition. I thought she was being nice, but of course she wasn't. This was Anna we were talking about. She'd planned this. She was seriously too much. I ran to find her and I was raging. She was happily talking to the other athletes, so I grabbed her wrist and pulled her away. How could you? Are you trying to ruin Liam's life? I yelled at her. Anna wasn't even bothered. She just smirked and said, Yup, I am, and so what? I was shaking by that point and I said, You're crazy. Why did you do it? What has Liam ever done to you? I did it because I hate you. You stole everything from me, including Liam. Huh? I was so confused. 
Since when did Anna like Liam? Well, Isaac appeared at the exact moment and he obviously heard what she said. He started shouting, You told me you did that to help me win, but no, you're a complete liar. So you're just jealous of Emma, huh? Okay then, now you can run after Liam as you wish. We're over. Anna was shocked and tried to explain that she'd done it for him, that he was misunderstanding her, but he wouldn't even look at her. He said, You won't get away with this, Anna. I'm going to tell the organizers right now. Anna tried to get him to stop, but he pushed her away, and she ended up falling onto the ground where she burst in tears. Ha! She deserved it. I went back to find Liam, and the organizers announced that there were some problems with the results, and that the competition would be repeated the following weekend. Liam looked so happy and hugged me. Everything worked out in the end. Well, at least for Liam and me. Liam still won first place, and now he's going to compete in the international competition. As for Anna and Isaac, well, they broke up, and Anna moved to another city with her mom and Isaac got kicked out of the athletes club. On another note, my mom and Anna's dad are getting married soon, and even though I can't stand Anna, I'm still going to go because it'll mean a lot to my mom. At least I don't need to live in the same house as Anna. She's gotta be the most jealous person I've ever met, and it's not done her any good. Envy really is poison. It's much better to just be happy with what you have right now, right? Sometimes in life, we do things we might not be proud of. But honestly, if I had to go back and do it all again, I wouldn't change a thing. Please listen to my story and let me know if you think I did the right thing. It's been a crazy ride. I'm Delilah, and I grew up as an orphan. When I was only five years old, my parents were arrested as they belonged to some kind of mafia. I didn't have any relatives, so I was sent to an orphanage. I was too young to really understand it all. I just thought my parents were so busy with work, they didn't have time to take care of me. But later, I understood that my parents were bad people, and that they'd often hit me and even starved me whenever I was naughty. Over the next four years, I was adopted by three different families. The first two didn't end so well, so they sent me back. But the third family was really nice. Unfortunately, luck wasn't on our side, though. There was a car accident. I was lucky enough to survive, but my adoptive parents didn't make it. I was devastated and got sent back to the orphanage. I didn't understand why I was so unlucky. It really felt like the universe was punishing me. Years passed by and no other families adopted me. So as soon as I turned 18, I left and decided to start on my own. But it wasn't easy. I'd had no real education, and I couldn't find a decent job. I did a lot of random jobs, like pizza deliveries, handing out flyers on the streets, and working in a supermarket for a bit, too. The money was never enough, though. I hate to admit this, but sometimes I stole groceries from work. However, one time I got caught, and of course, they fired me. That sucked. How would I be able to make it to tomorrow with two bucks in my wallet now? I vented out with my coworker Casey about how miserable my life would be without that job. Then Casey just smirked at me and said she knew another way I could make some money. She said it was just a one-time thing and it would be risky, but the money would be enough to last me for years. I was eager to hear more, but you won't believe what it was. The job was to kidnap the daughter of a rich family and then demand ransom. Casey said all I had to do was take care of the kid for a few days in an abandoned warehouse, and when the parents paid the ransom, they'd send the kid back, and I'd be free to go with all the money. I mean, it sounded easy, right? It's not like I was actually kidnapping her. I was just taking care of her for a few days, more like a babysitter, so nothing could go wrong, right? The little girl was called Lisa, and she was just two years old. Her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Taylor, were well-known, and they were stinking rich. The plan was actually so simple. Every Sunday, her nanny took her to the playground, and so that's where she'd be kidnapped from. You're probably wondering if it worked out. Well, I'm not in jail right now, so there you have it. I was waiting in the warehouse, and they delivered Lisa to me. Now, all we have to do is wait. The warehouse was pretty shabby, but it had enough to survive. And at first, Lisa cried a lot, and I seriously couldn't get her to stop. 
I tried playing her Baby Shark on YouTube. Believe it or not, it worked, and she stopped immediately. Later that night, though, Casey called and said Lisa's parents refused to pay and that the police were involved. Oh my gosh. So now what? They couldn't just leave me here with this random kid. The only option Casey could think of was that me and Lisa should hide out at Casey's grandparents' farm for a couple of years. That's when the case died down and everyone had forgotten about it. We could just leave Lisa outside a police station. This was insane. But what choice did I have? Lisa's face was now plastered on every newspaper and webpage. Also, not to mention the fact I knew nothing about raising a kid. What a disaster! But hey, at least I'd get to move to a farm. So the next morning, Casey's cousin, who drives vegetables from the farm to the city, picked us up and drove us safely to the farm. It was perfect, because Casey's grandparents didn't own a TV or the internet, so they knew nothing about the missing kid. Casey told them I was a single mom and had nowhere else to live, so they warmly welcomed us and said in return I could help them out on the farm. Those first few weeks were torture. Lisa was so naughty. Every time I fed her, she'd throw her food around. And once, she threw a hot bowl of soup over my head. After that, I was tempted to let her starve. I couldn't handle it. To be honest, I hated her. I regretted so bad getting involved in this mess every time I saw her face. But then one night, she was lying on the bed and I was impressed. She'd finally chilled out. I went to wake her up to take her down for dinner, and she was on fire! I started panicking and went to find a thermometer, and her temp was 39 degrees Celsius. I had to get her fever down. I asked Casey's grandparents to help me buy some medicine for her. I was seriously panicking because she was shaking now. I just picked her up and held her in my arms, and I realized I would protect this little girl no matter what. She looked so innocent, and I actually felt my heart open up to her. We must have fallen asleep because I suddenly woke up an hour or so later and was relieved to see her body temp was back to normal. After that, I felt closer to Lisa, and honestly, she was pretty cute. Soon, I was sewing her little dresses and cooking her favorite foods. We actually had so much in common. We both loved mac and cheese, hated carrots, and were addicted to chocolate. Pretty soon, a year had flown by, and Lisa was starting to speak. And then she started to sing. And, oh man, she's the most adorable thing on earth. Then one day, she turned to me and said, Mama! I almost cried. I felt so happy, but it wasn't right. I had to give her back to her parents. She didn't deserve to live a life away from them, like I had with my parents. So I did something crazy. I saw Lisa's parents were looking for a part-time maid, so I used a fake name and applied for the job. I wanted to see if it was safe to take Lisa back without getting caught, but it was immediately clear that something wasn't right. It was like they didn't even miss her. I mean, imagine if your child had been kidnapped. Surely, you'd be crying a lot, right? This family was different. All they seemed to do was work. It was so easy to sneak around their house. They left for work at 9 a.m. every morning and would only come back at 7 p.m. The only one I had to be careful of was Mrs. Garcia, the housekeeper. One day, I was searching for Lisa's room to see if I could get some of her toys, but I couldn't find it anywhere. There wasn't a single room that looked like it belonged to a two-year-old. Had they seriously already packed up her room? Just given up hope? So I decided to search the basement, and jackpot, I found a box full of toys. But that's not the only thing that was there. There was a crumpled up photo too. I got curious and unfolded it, and saw a little girl in the photo. I froze. That little girl wasn't Lisa. She was about five years old and looked familiar. It's like I've seen her before. Could it be? Is that me? But why did Lisa's parents have a photo of me? Suddenly, Mrs. Garcia appeared and said, What are you doing down here? I knew there was something fishy about you. I'm going to call Mr. Taylor. She quickly took out her phone and was about to dial his number. I grabbed it from her. But oh man, this old lady was strong. We were fighting over her phone, and then she let it go. 
She looked shocked and pointed at me, then in a trembling voice said, You, you are Delilah, aren't you? I was stunned. How did she know my real name? Oh, God, she must have known I'd kidnapped Lisa. I was probably about to go to jail. But then she continued speaking, and I thought I was going to faint. Lisa's parents were also my biological parents, which made Lisa my sister. Mrs. Garcia had recognized me because she saw the scar on my arm, which she said I'd got from falling out of a tree. She'd worked for my family since before I was even born. But then she said something that shocked me even more. Don't come back to this family, Delilah. Please, it's for your own good. If you stay... You'll be in danger like poor little Lisa. They didn't care about her at all. They often left her starving, and then she got kidnapped. They haven't even bothered to look for her. They're cruel and heartless, and all they care about is money. Having a kid was just part of the cover-up for them and their illegal business. I really hope Lisa is in a safe place now. Anything is better than this family. Oh, my God. This was seriously crazy. After all these years, I'd finally found my parents. But deep down, I knew Mrs. Garcia was right. If Lisa and I came back, our lives would be hell. Before I left the room, I asked Mrs. Garcia one last question. Did my parents look for me when they got out of jail? Mrs. Garcia shook her head sadly. Let's be honest, though. I knew the answer before I even asked. So... I went back to the farm and continued to take care of Lisa. Now that I knew she was my sister, I loved her even more and promised myself that I'd give her the life she deserved. It's been 10 years now, and we're doing great. Our parents did do a bit of searching for Lisa, but only for like a month. Then they gave up. Mrs. Garcia had been right. They didn't care about Lisa or me. When it felt safe, Lisa and I moved to Canada. I started to work in a few different places, and even took some classes. Turns out, I have a passion for plants, and I can thank my time on the farm for that. So, I opened a small plant shop, and the business is going so well. Lisa is my motivation. She's the reason I work so hard and keep fighting for our lives. And now we're happier than we've ever been. When Lisa turns 18, I'm going to tell her everything. But for now... I'll let her think our parents aren't evil people and that they're just busy working in another country. So, what do you think? Would you agree I did the right thing? I think I did.